This is Unit 15, Property Management and Leasing. Property management is not a new field. It basically got kick-started by two factors. In the 1800s, high-risk construction started, and large companies and investors needed property managers to manage their companies, real estate operations. Then in the 1930s, after the Great Depression, there was a tremendous amount of foreclosures and lenders took back properties. So they had to manage those properties as rentals. Then in 1933, to improve professional standards of management of, of property management, a group of about 100 companies met and formed the Institute of Real Estate Management. And that acronym, acronym is IREM. And that is a division of the National Association of Realtors, NAR. IREM managers certified that they would, number one, refrain from commingling their clients' funds with their personal funds, meaning as checks came in, they would deposit them into their personal account to cover their own bills. That's called commingling, and that's not allowed by IREM standards. They would bond all employees handling clients' funds, disclose all fees, commissions, or other payments received as a result of activity relating to their client's property. Later on, IREM changed its policy and developed a personal designation for individual managers, and that's called a Certified Property Manager, CPM. So this certified the individual manager rather than the company that employed them. The CPM designation was designed to ensure that managers have the general business and industry specific experience necessary to maintain high standards within the management profession. To earn a CPM designation, an individual must actively support the Institute's rules and regulations, demonstrate honesty, integrity, and the ability to manage real estate, including three years experience in a responsible real estate management position, be a member of a local real estate board, and a member of NAR, National Association of Realtors. IREM also has a couple other designations, the Accredited Resident Manager, ARM, for residential managers, and the Accredited Management Organization, AMO, is a designation for IREM companies. There are different kinds of property managers. The three basic kinds of managers are the licensee property manager, the individual property manager, and resident managers. The licensee property manager is, a, is basically a licensee. You have a license and you work within a real estate office or agency that manages a number of properties. That person will normally work full time in property management under the supervision of their broker. Persons working under the direction of a supervisor of a licensed property manager need not be licensed. An individual property manager normally manages a single property for an owner and may or may not be possess a real estate license. That person is normally employed on a straight salary basis. A resident manager, as the title implies, lives on the property and may be employed by the owner or the managing agent. Normally in California, if you have units of 16 units or more, you must have an on-site resident manager. Normally you're looking for somebody with previous management experience before you have them be a resident property manager. As a property manager, you need to recognize what the owner is, invest is interested in, and basically that's the property. They want to get the highest and best use or return on their property, realizing the highest and best use. So I'm using the property in its highest and best use, which affords me to get top dollar in rents. And with top dollars in rents, then I get a higher net operating income. They also want to make sure that you enhance the property and take care of its physical appearance. So basically, as a property manager, you're relieving the owner's responsibility in executive functions as well as all details connected with the operation of the property. And you're making sure the money comes in, the cash flow comes in, and you're paying attention to the physical upkeep of the property. So some of the things you'll be responsible for as a property manager, 
is of course marketing the properties and advertising the properties and securing desirable rents, collecting rents, handling tenant complaints, and physically caring for the premises. In addition, you'll be purchasing supplies and equipment and paying for repairs, hiring employees, keeping proper records and preparing required reports, and making any recommendations to the owner as far as improvements, rents, insurance coverage, and other operational changes that you see fit. One of the most important things a property manager will do is establish rent schedules, meaning what rent schedules should be assigned to these properties. In doing that, you have to look around the neighborhood and see what the scarcity is. You know, what's available for rent right now? Are there enough? Are there too many? And then you want to look at comparable rent values. So you're doing research to come up with your proper rent schedules. And you're doing that by making a skilled and thorough analysis of the neighborhood. To come up with your rent schedules, you need to do a number of things, including looking at the character of the immediate neighborhood, the economic level, size of families, trends in population, directional growth of the community, the availability of transportation, recreation, shopping, houses to worship, schools, the condition of the housing market versus the population growth trends, and the current vacancy factors. You'll take all this into account to come up with your rent schedule for your property that you're managing. And your objective is to achieve a combination of rent and vacancy factors that provides the highest net to your owner. In addition, you must deal with occupational health and safety issues and respect OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act. It's important to, it's important to follow the law because OSHA can assign fines for health and safety issues up to $12,934. OSHA can also assist fines for re repeated violations of over 129,000. Qual qualifications of a property manager. One of the things a property manager has to be is a merchandising expert. The manager needs to know where to advertise a property and how to advertise a property. Is it in Craigslist? Is it in Zillow? Is it somewhere else where you can attract people to see the merits of the building? And that's what the property manager needs to advertise about. If it has a nice pool, if it's spacious living rooms, uh, near amenities, those are the things a merchandising specialist needs to bring out to push the property and get it rented out. As a leasing expert, you need to know the perfect type of lease agreement and contracts to use for the clients coming in. If it's a commercial property, maybe it's going to be a base plus a percentage lease, something like that. If it's residential, does month to month work better or is it better for a six month or a one year lease? In addition to the property manager needs to be an accounting specialist or have somebody in the office that is and use some good software where they can keep good and accurate records in order to satisfy inquiries from their tenants and also down the road so should they get audited by the DRE. The property ma manager must also be a maintenance supervisor and really do a lot of preventative maintenance and also do repairs as they come up. So they need to be well-tooled as far as preventative repairs and also repairing items that do break during the course of their term. They also need to be a purchasing su supervisor and make sure that they're up on all current technologies that are available to, to recommend to their owner as far as preventative installations that they need to make sure that the longevity of the apartment building, say, will go on for a long time before repairs are needed, or to make sure and make obsolescent features repaired on a timely basis to make sure they don't break down and cause any inconvenience to the property. They also need to be a credit specialist. One of the things you want to do is make sure you have good qualified people that come into rent. You don't want to have somebody that creates credit issues right off the bat and can't make their payments. So make sure you understand a credit report, what you're looking at, what kind of tolerance you'll accept, 
and also what kind of credit scores you're looking for because you want to make sure that somebody that does come in will pay you on time on a monthly basis. Property manager also needs to be an insurance advisor, making sure they understand their blanket policy or their master insurance policy over all the units. If there's adequate coverage to make sure that anything that happens down the road would be covered by insurance. In addition to make sure that they can talk to the current tenants about what sort of coverage they need for their personal items inside their apartments. So pers personal coverage for the interior walls and their personal items in the property. They need to be covered also if they're not covered by the master insurance policy. Property manager should also understand tax returns and how that Schedule E in the tax returns is, is prepared. Make sure they understand, you know, make sure they understand their profit and loss from the business on a monthly basis and how depreciation works in concert with that to drop the taxable income that shows on a tax return. They also need to be a psychology expert and a good communicator for day-to-day -day issues that may happen within the within the apartment complex or the commercial structure. They also need to be a budget manager. Just like in the tax returns, they have to understand what gross income is needed for them to net a profit, the net operating income after all expenses are taken out. So they should be able to communicate with their owner and talk about budget expenses meaning income that comes in and what kind of expenses are paid out. So what types of properties are managed? By far the most properties that are managed are residential properties. So those could be one to four units, single family homes, condominiums, um, where a property manager may have a book of business that is all residential properties. In addition to, if they're residential properties, they need to understand and be able to explain local ordinances like rent control and make sure that they can work in concert with that as they charge and increase their leases on the properties. They also need to understand state and fair housing regulations as they relate to their properties that they're managing. In addition to, they should also look and educate themselves on Section 8 housing, which is a credit from HUD Housing and Urban Development to offset monthly rents by an occupant of one of the units that a property manager may lease. And this is something now that can't be ignored. You can't tell a tenant coming in who is inquiring about Section 8 housing that you're not approved for Section 8 housing. You have to respect the Section 8 housing request, which in a sense is part of, in a sense, is part of that person's income as they're getting a credit for the housing that they're renting from you. So by law, you have to respect Section 8 housing, and you cannot tell somebody you can't rent to them because your property is not Section 8 approved. You have to consider that. Now you have to consider a lot of things too, like credit, other income how people have maintained or had a relation with their previous landlord, how they took care of the property. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration when offering somebody a lease. And one of the things you have to consider today is Section 8 housing. Another opportunity today for property managers is to represent condominium projects or cooperatives. Um, it's a big business these days where owners of condominiums will have a, an association created and then have a property manage, manager come in and run that association for them. Some of the duties of the HOA or homeowners association and the property management would be collecting fees from the members, uh, issuing financial statements to the association, contracting and hiring all maintenance and repairs on the property, enforcing the CCNRs, conditions, covenants and restrictions on the property, and handling tenant issues also in disputes or complaints. In addition, the HOM manager may do some other things also, like helping file tax returns, as well as handling workers' comp claims, un unemployment compensation, insurance, and so on. They also want to ensure that 
the property is properly insured against damage because they want to protect the owner's liability against any future damage to the property and make sure they're covered. And also they can make suggestions to the board of directors because during that time, the HOA normally will speak directly with the condominium projects, board of directors, and also attend and manage the meetings that they have. In addition, property managers can help with mobile home parks. They can help with park development, public amenities, enforced park rules, approval of lease assignments on sale units. Because when you do sell a unit in that property, somebody may choose to stay there or possibly if they sell the unit, it may be moved to another location. So in that case, you're going to arrange having somebody bring in a new unit and assign them a new lease to that specific space in the mobile home park. Multifamily family units are also very big. Um, residential properties, normally you, the definition multifamily is over four units because residential is one to four units. Five or more, you'll call multifamily. And statistics indicate today that the lion's share of people out renting today are in multifamily. Almost 30% of the residential housing in the United States is designated multifamily. Many times a large portion of the book of business of a property manager are single family homes where people have investment properties, but that owner just does not want to manage those properties. Or maybe a situation where you have a military person who owns a property and gets transferred, say, to the East Coast from the West Coast, and they don't have the time or capabilities to manage those properties, so they'll hire a property manager who would take care of all the day-to-day -day corrections, repairs, collect rents, and then on a monthly basis, they get paid a check, a net check, on the income generated from the property. Generally, single-family units require a little more management time per unit than multifamily units, and this can reflect in the property management charges per month. Normally, and this is generally, so don't hold me to this, but most single-family property managers charge about 10%. So if your rent is $2,000 a month and you're collecting $200 a month, your income to help manage the property. Other types of properties managers are office buildings or major, major commercial properties. Um, larger uses of office space such as banks, savings and loan association, insurance companies. They also have their own presence, presence in the building, but they also provide um, excess, excess office units to lease out to other businesses also. Many times with overbuilding or oversaturation of office buildings creates higher vacancy rates. In such case, a property manager really needs to try to get in and market those individual units to get leased out. One of the, one of the tactics they may use is, is to get somebody to trade up or move to a larger unit and then lease out the smaller unit. In addition to attract people to come in and lease office spaces, they may possibly include tenant improvements. Maybe if they're coming in, it's just a blank shell of an office. They could build that office out for the person that or the company that's coming in for their new office. In addition, they can offer other incentives like one month free, two months free, something like that. Anything to with a high vacancy rate to get those spaces filled so you get cash flow coming in. Property managers in this type of building has a lot of things going on and they need to maintain, uh, like servicing all operating equipment and public facilities such as lobbies, lights, and washrooms, maintaining the elevators, and working with a repairman on the maintenance contracts, cleaning, which is usually done at night by a staff, and other routine maintenance, including window cleaning, waste removal, light bulb replacement, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. All these have to be done to make sure that that, that property is in pristine working condition and is attractive to other people coming in thinking about leasing in that building. Re retail space also requires some of the same skills as, as has been mentioned in office management. 
a lot of times you want to make sure you have a good mix of business in that retail space. For example, if you have a strip center with 16 um, spaces for rent, you probably don't want to have two coffee shops in there, but get a, a nice mix of businesses that really complement each other, that bring in people that are attracted maybe by one business, but then walk next door and buy something else also. So it's a good mix and, and complements the effectiveness of the building to get people to come in and purchase items. Property managers managing industrial properties also must have a great skill set in managing industrial areas. They need to know many things in different areas. Industrial managers might manage specific might manage a specific property or an entire industrial park. The industrial property manager's duties may be varied. Um, but the main things they need to be concerned with are related to renting the properties, and they also involve protecting the property and the owners from liability. Security is very important, and any property you have should have a reputation that it's very secure and protects the tenants and owners against liability. The property manager should use his or her best efforts to make sure the premises are reasonably safe as possible. In addition to, in addition to protecting the physical structure and making sure that's secure, one of the things you really need to protect is the data of your tenants and owners. So make sure your computers are protected. Get an antivirus software, any hacking software. Uh, get an encryption program going. Uh, store your information on the cloud. When you leave the office, remove all the memory sticks. And Probably a good good advice too is to use a, concert, a security consultant to make sure that your data is protected. As you enter into a, an agreement with an owner, and it doesn't matter whether it's residential, industrial, or commercial property, make sure that you have a written agreement with your owner. A management agreement that formalizes the relationship between the owner and the manager and points out, points out the rights and duties of each party. In addition, the management contract can have other items included in it also. For example, reimbursement of costs. Say, for example, you prepaid for some advertising, and at the end of the month, you turn in your reimbursement to get your money back for the advertising. Generally, the more management problems a property has, the higher the management fee. In addition to, the larger number of properties tend to be managed at a lower percentage rate. Although the number of bookkeeping records needed depends on the type of property you're, management, you're managing and will determine the, the kind of management software you need to manage the company. Most importantly, the trust fund accounting. Those monies that come in as deposits, say, from your tenants and rents, they need to be tracked in a trust fund accounting system. If you're ever going to get audited on something, it'll be on trust fund accounting. Section 2830 of the Commissioner's Regulations requires that a trust fund ledger for property management accounts must be established. As rents come in, they are posted in the owner's account. Also recorded in the trust fund ledger is the money paid out on behalf of the owner. These expenses are charged against the income of the property, and the manager sends a statement to the owner at the end of each month. There's all kinds of software available to make your life easier. And as far as property management goes, there's software for financial record keeping, rent analysis, tenant letters, uh, vendor lists and purchase orders, employee files, owners 1099s, meaning if you hire a contractor to perform some work on your property and you pay over $600, you need to issue a 1099 to that contractor. Software is available at all kinds of costs. It could be from around $200 to $10,000. Make sure you find the right software that will satisfy your needs because it may eliminate you from a costly audit or, or discrepancy in payments. One of the responsibilities of a property manager is to actually drop the leases. You're acting as a consultant for the owner. You're going to write the lease up for a specific, specified period of time possibly even with a termination date included in that lease. On the lease, 
the owner is the lessor and the tenant is the lessee. The basic types of leases that you'll be working with, some examples would be the, an estate for years, an estate from period to period, an estate of sufferance, and a, and a state of will. An estate for years continues for a definite fixed period of time. It could be month to month, six months, one year. One of the things to remember with any lease over one year, that has to be in writing. And one other thing to remember on a state for years, it has to have a definite termination date. And a state from period to period is commonly called a periodic tenancy. The lease continues from period to period, um, could be year to year, month to month, or week to week as designated. The most common periodic tenancy is month to month. One of the things that uh, needs to a periodic tenancy can be ended by a notice. Normally the notice is a 30-day notice. However, if somebody has lived in a property for at least 12 months, the landlord must give a 60-day notice to terminate the tenancy. And a state at sufferance just means that the lease term has expired. For example, if somebody has signed a year lease with a landlord and that year lease has expired, that's an estate at sufferance. Two things can happen. Either the tenant can keep making payments and then has a right to live in the property, and normally that would convert to a month to month, or if they stop making payments, then they need to leave the property or the landlord will start an eviction proceedings, commonly called an unlawful detainer. And a state at will has no specified time period. Uh, possession is given to the lessee, it's given to the lessee and rents paid, but there's no specified term as to the termination of the lease. In California, when you're going to terminate an estate at will, it requires a 30-day notice. In commercial leases, you'll hear about these three types of leases, a gross lease, a net lease, and a percentage lease. On a gross lease, the tenant pays a fixed amount of rent per month to the owner, and with that, the owner pays all his monthly expenses out of that lease. So that's a gross lease. If you're renting for $4,000 a month on a commercial property, you pay $4,000 a month, and you can't be expected to pay anything else to offset the owner's expenses. Under a net lease, or sometimes it's called a triple net lease, the lessee will pay a monthly stated fixed payment, but then be responsible for other things like maintenance, repairs, sometimes real estate taxes and utilities. So they'll pay their base at say $2,500 a month and then pay amount for utilities, real estate taxes and maintenance. So they'll cover the expenses that the owner would normally pay. A percentage lease is something you commonly see in shopping centers where somebody, somebody has a sales business and the lease is based on the amount of production on a monthly basis, based on gross sales. So it could be something like somebody makes $10,000 a month and it's 10% of that, well, that's $1,000. Or it could also be that you have a base rent, say it's $3,500 a month, and then it's 10% of the gross sales. So 10% would be that $1,000, so that's $4,500 a month. So that's common for shopping centers and places that sell product on a monthly basis, like clothing and other distributors. Sometimes a lessor may want to get out of a percentage lease, and what they'll use is a recapture, a recapture clause. So in this situation where the tenant's not getting the gross sales that they anticipated on a monthly basis, and then based on a low percentage uh, from that number, the lessor the owner is not making what they expected, they can actually terminate the lease based on the recapture clause. Here's a couple examples on percentage leases, and you can look in your book for some other examples, and they're also published in some periodicals that you may want to look at. Let's say, for example, you have a parking lot. You can expect to pay like 50% on a percentage deal with your owner. On a supermarket, probably 2%. Here's some requirements that should be included in a valid lease. It should contain the names of the lessor, the lessee, be in writing if it's longer than one year, 
contain an adequate description of the property, show the amount of rent and the manner of payment, The contract has to be between parties who are capable of contracting. It has to state the duration of time, the lease to be is, is the lease to be enforced. If you're using an automatic re renewal provision, that has to be in bold type. Um, we talked about leases over a year having to be in writing. You can have leases, of course, for less than a year, but it's always in your best interest to put everything in writing to make sure everybody's aware of the situation and the responsibilities of either party. Most rentals are residential and the pro property managers are primarily involved in residential leases. The property managers has a duty to protect the owner. If you have a tenant who does not regularly pay rent or is in a, uh, then that's almost worse than having no tenant at all because you're maintaining the property of somebody who's living on the property and may be destructive to the property and in addition is not paying any rent. So you're really digging a hole for the owner. And something has to be done to get positive cash flow in that unit and that could possibly getting getting a tenant out. One of the things you never want to do is have somebody preoccupy the unit prior to all the information on them coming through credit report, background check, checking in with previous landlords, it would be, it is very difficult to get somebody out after they're into a unit um, because it does take time to get an unlawful detainer to go through and then get the tenant out. So if you're a property manager, until the lease is consummated and all the background checks are done, don't let somebody move in. In addition to, if you're selling real estate, do not let somebody preoccupy the house prior to closing. The rental application is where you're going to get information on your prospective tenant. Will they be a good candidate? Do they pay their rent on time? Do they have enough income to qualify to make that payment plus their other bills? Some of the things you want to do, of course, is to pull a credit report. Probably even get a copy of the last pay stub to show the income corresponds to the income put up, placed on the application. So you need to verify that income. So what you want to do with that application, of course, is to verify length of employment, how much they make, in addition to check with previous landlords to make sure that they took care of the property and paid their rent payment on time. Now, when you do these type of things, you have to be consistent. You can't discriminate in any way in the form of, say, not doing a background check on, on applicant A, but doing a background check on somebody else because you feel some concerns about applicant B. You can't do that. Do your background checks, make sure they're consistent, and follow all the fair housing laws. It's also a good idea to get a copy of the applicant's driver's license for two things. Some of that information you'll need to order the credit report. In addition to, you want to verify that that's a person's name who's on the application. Now, you want to follow all the fair housing laws and not discriminate upon anybody, but you can deny people from moving into a property because of poor credit history. They broke rules at a, at a previous place that they lived at. They damaged the property. They didn't make their payments on time. So as you go through your research, this is what you're going to build your determining factor on who you allow to move in and who you say is not quite the person you're looking for to move into the property. As we talked about before, even if you're using a month-to-month -month lease, it's in your best interest to put the lease in writing. That way it sets forth the lessor and lessee duties and obligations to each other. If somebody's renting into a, an apartment complex, or a homeowners association, say a condominium project, make sure and include a copy of the apartment or HOA, HOA rules and regulations and attach that to the assigned lease and return that to the lessee so they can have that for future reference. Make sure you get the parties named on the lease also. It's important to let them know that 
your names are on this lease. We're not including anybody else's names on here. So if you move in, that does not give you the right to have your friend come in and start living with you. That has to be okayed by the landlord and the owner prior to that happening. In addition to, you want to make sure if somebody's under 18 years old, you may want to look at a co-signer or a personal guarantor to protect your case, protect yourself in, in case someone goes into default. That's always a good idea, and I've done that in the past with my units, where if somebody, did, say, as a student, doesn't have any credit history, so I really can't make a determination on the risk that I'm taking by letting them move in, I may go back to one of the parents and say, hey, listen, I'd like you to be a personal guarantor on here. Um, that way, if payments don't come through, then I'm going to be calling you to make sure I get my rent payment. In addition to, let all the parties on the contract know that is a sign that this is jointly and severally, meaning, meaning that you're not renting bedrooms, you know. The rent is $3,000 a month. So at the end of the month, you're owed, or the owner's owed $3,000. If someone in the group, say it's three people living in the property, somebody doesn't have their money, that $3,000 is still due. So the other two people have to come forward and pay the rent. And then, then they can collect from the third person. But once again, you're not renting bedrooms. So if somebody can't pay, you're not just forwarding $2,000 saying, well, so-and-so didn't have his, his rent check. We can't give it to you. Jointly and severally means the rent is due wholly at the end of the month or the beginning of the month. Always do an inspection. You will walk through to make sure they can identify anything they see that's deficient in the property. Maybe there's a cracked tile or a leaking faucet. Identify that up front. What you can do is give them a move-in, move-out form and include that with the contract and let them know, hey, listen, in the next week, I want you to go through the property and identify anything that you think is wrong with the property. So at the end of your lease term, I'm not going to think that that was caused by your tenancy. So in addition to by joining a board of realtors, you have all the CAR, California Association of Realtor forms, at your disposal. So you can use your lease right off the CAR forms, and it's in zip forms. In addition to with that, there is a move in, move out form that you can use also and give that directly to your tenants. The security deposit basically acts as a form of insurance for the landlord in case a rental the rental premises are left damaged or dirty or when rent is owed. Now, normally this isn't prepaid rent, but it's for damages. So if somebody moves out and, and leaves the, the unit in a disastrous form, it's dirty, things are broken, you can start using that deposit to making correction and doing repairs. Now, one of the things you need to do also is make sure you keep an itemized list of what repairs you've done because with that, you have to do your itemized list and then deduct the repairs from the security deposit and then forward to the tenant your itemized list and the remainder of the security deposit after deductions. California has a couple of rules about security deposits. Number one is the most you can charge somebody for an unfurnished apartment is two months rent. For a furnished apartment, you can charge three months. One of the things to remember too is non-refundable deposits are not allowed. You need to do your itemized deduction and give them the balance after they've moved out. So once a tenant has moved out, you have three weeks to do your itemized deduction and do your repairs. Once you do that, within three weeks, you need to send your tenants a copy of your itemized deductions and also copies of receipts for labor and material that you've used to bring the unit back up to standards. Okay, that's residential. If you're a landlord in a commercial site, you've got 60 days to do that. Lease options aren't very common, but they can happen, especially in times of tight money policy, meaning there isn't much, say, mortgage lending available. So somebody may want to come in and do a lease option. 
they'll come in and say, I want to rent your property, but I want to have the option within a year to purchase a property at this specified sales price. And those things can happen. Sometimes, too, what an owner will do is say, all right, you pay X amount in rent, and I'm going to take, say, the top 25% of it and put that aside towards your down payment as it's time for you to exercise your option and move in. So that's a lease option to purchase. Details in the lease can provide a landlord the right to enter the property. If they're, if this is a, in absence of the lease, the landlord can enter the property under three, three circumstances. An emergency, tenant consents to the entry, entries during normal business hours. A landlord can enter the property uh, after a reasonable notice is given, given, normally with 24 hours notice, a landlord can enter the property to do necessary repairs, alterations, or improvements. They can also enter if there's suspicion that the tenant has abandoned the property. And also a landlord can enter if he's obtained a court order to enter the property. Landlords in California have to make some disclosures. Here's a list of some of them. Existence of registered sex offenders in the area, that's Megan's Law. Presence of known lead-based paint. Any pesticides used. Any asbestos discovered on the property. Any known carcinogenic material. Uh, methamphetamines contamination. Application for demolition permit. If the property is within one mile of a closed military base where explosives were stored, if the unit was a condominium conversion. Now, once again, you get help from the Board of Realtors on this because if you do join the Board of Realtors, once again, you're a member of CAR. And with CAR, you can use their zip forms. And with zip forms, if you're using a lease, most of these disclosures are included in there. So you can just click them down and takes a position in your package that you can actually email to somebody and they can do an electronic signature on it. So it's a great benefit to join your Board of Realtors. The landlord does have some applied responsibilities to warrant the condition of the property to make sure it's habitable. Some of those things may include that the plumbing is in working order. Uh, heat, lights, and wiring work and are safe. Floors, stairway, and railings are all in good condition. When rented, the president Premises are clean and free of pests. Areas under lesser control are all well maintained. The roof does not leak and no doors or windows are broken. If the landlord leases an untenable unit dwelling, the lesser could be liable for actual damages sustained by the tenant and special damages of not less than $100 or more than $1,000. The tenant can also raise the defense of habitability against any eviction notice, meaning if the tenant stopped paying because the property was uninhabitable and the lessor started an unlawful, unlawful detainer eviction, then the tenant can come back and say, listen, the place is inhabitable. I couldn't pay a rent on it because of the habitability of the premises. If the landlord fails to make correction app, corrective action when a repair is needed and it's a landlord's responsibility, there's a couple things that can happen. The tenant can abandon the property and not be held liable for back rents or unf the unfulfilled lease. The tenant may refer the problem to a mediator or an arbitrator uh, or in other condition situations, possibly small claims court. The tenant can also contact the landlord in writing and say, hey, my property's uninhabitable. It's winter time and the heater's not working. And if the landlord does not respond, then the tenant can go ahead and use his own mechanic to go in and fix the heater or whatever utility that might be, and then offset the rent with the amount they paid to get that unit fixed. Or the tenant can remain in possession of the property at a reduced rent. These last two items regarding fixing with your own money and then deducting from the rent and remaining in the property, uh, possession of the property and paying a reduced rent, um, 
tenants may only do that twice in each calendar year. The landlord must also allow the installation of electronic vehicle charging stations as long as they meet minimum standards. The landlord must also allow the tenant to grow agricultural items in potable containers that meet minimum standards. The tenant, on the other hand, by way of California Civil Code, must keep the property in a clean living and sanitary environment, must dispose of garbage and other waste items, use all the utility fixtures properly, keeping them clean and sanitary, and avoid defacing or damaging the property. They must also use the property only for its intended lawful use, pay rent on time, abide by the rules and regulations, give a 30-day notice when vacating, return door and mailbox keys when leaving, leave the unit in, clean, in a clean condition when vacating, providing that the terms of the lease do not prohibit such activity, a tenant has a right to assign or sublet his or her apartment. The assignment basically means transferring the lease entirely to somebody else, to that third party, they're going to assign the lease and then it becomes the third party's full responsibility to take care of that lease and by way eliminating party two, meaning the lessee, of his responsibility on that lease. In any case, if this is in the lease or not in the lease, contact the landlord, ask them, tell them what you intend to do, and, and ask for their permission to go forward. Make sure everybody understands that you're going to do an assignment of the lease, and here's the new party, because I'm sure the landlord will want to do his own background check on that new tenant coming in, credit, background check on income and such to make sure that that person will be making the payment on time to their new lease. A sublease is different. It's sometimes called a sandwich lease. So say, for example, the, less, the lessor, the landlord is A, and I'm tenant B, but I want to sublease. I'm going to go away for, th for three months over the summer to do a play in New York. I may want to sublease to renter C to come in and satisfy my lease. Once again, in a case like this, I would go ahead and talk to the landlord to make sure that this is okay. Now, something that's different from the previous lease we talked about, the assignment, uh, in this case with the sublease, I'm still responsible for the lease. So if, if renter C does not pay me, I still have to pay the landlord. So that's a sublease or a sandwich lease. Sometimes, if in a sublease situation, a lessee may rent for higher than the amount that they're paying at the time. In that case, if that portion over the normal rent uh, comes in higher than, than is normally due, in most circumstances, that should be split between the lessor and the lessee. One of the things you should also make sure if you're going to increase a lease payment is make sure and look for look into local rent control ordinances to make sure you're not violating any, violating any local rent control laws. So how can a lease be terminated? Well, the first way is if the landlord evicts the tenant. Uh, also, if either party um, destroys the premises, then an eviction can occur. If the premises is destroyed, say by a natural disaster, then, then the structure is unusable and a termination of the lease is created. The landlord can tem terminate the lease also if the premises is used for unauthorized purposes or on abandonment, abandonment of the premises by the tenant, by either party on breach of a condition of the lease. The tenant can terminate the lease on breach of implied warranties of habitability by the landlord. The landlord can use an unlawful detainer action to evict a tenant, either by using a 30 to 60 day notice if they and the tenant has failed to re respect the 30 or 60 day notice, 
then the landlord can bring an unlawful detainer action. Or if the tenant has been in violation of some provision of the lease, the landlord can also bring an unlawful detainer suit against the tenant. Evictions and unlawful detainer. The process of removing a tenant or being behind in rent normally follows this action. Uh, if rent's not being paid, uh, the landlord serves the tenant with a three-day notice to pay or quit, meaning you have three days to pay me the back rent or I'm going to start an unlawful detainer action. If the tenant fails to respect the, the three-day notice, then the tenant files an unlawful detainer action in Superior Court. If the landlord wins in court and receives the judgment, then the landlord asks for a writ of possession authorizing the Sheriff's Department to evict the tenant. At that point, the Sheriff's Department takes over and sends the tenant an eviction notice. If the tenant fails to leave, then the Sheriff can physically remove the tenant from the premises and the landlord will charge for fees and costs of that removal. In some communities, unlawful detainer actions can be used to abate drug-related nuisances also. After eviction, some property managers frequently take action against tenants and former tenants in small claims court. Attorneys are not allowed in small claims court, and the maximum amount of suit is $5,000. I would check with your local jurisdiction and make sure you know what the maximum dollar amount for recovery um, that would be due in your own local courts, because that may change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. A landlord is not allowed to, to retaliate against a tenant for some complaining to the landlord or complaining to a public agency about defects, uh, lawfully organizing a tenant association. They can't come back and do any retaliatory type of eviction on them. Uh, what they cannot do is, is increase rent, try to evict the tenant within 180 days after the tenant exercises a right, of, right protected under the law. In fact, the prohibition of Retaliatory eviction is a, a defense against eviction. If the landlord has been shown to have acted maliciously, the tenant can be entitled to damages anywhere from $100 to $2,000 in punitive damages. The landlord cannot threaten to physically evict the tenant or menace the tenant. If they try to do that, the landlord is subject to a $2,000 fine for his actions.